Good evening to Germany and hello all over the world, especially to USA. And welcome to our special guest this evening, Mrs. Karen Carlson. We are so looking forward to what will, be, what will we hear from you. And it's very interesting tonight. We are here together uh, in an electronic way and it's very exciting. And Nancy, yes, I will give the words to you. Okay. Well, this is really exciting. I've, I've never had so many people in a big meeting like this before. But um, let me to give you a little bit of an introduction. Um, Dr. Karen Glenner Carlson is going to tell you, all the people listening oh, today, a great oh, story oh, about her and Albert Einstein. It's a fascinating story. I'm so happy that she is able tonight to tell the story. Normally, she would be sitting here in our office. Um, we have been planning this for at least three months, and she was supposed to be in Ulm to tell the story, but maybe it's even more interesting to have it so that members of our association throughout the world can be listening to her story because it's a great one. Um, because Karen has so much to say, I think we should just uh, start. And um, I give you a couple of, I, couple of technical details. Please keep your video monitors off and um, mute your uh, microphones so that there's no feedback. Um, but during the presentation, if you have any questions, Karen is, is really happy to answer them. So you could unmute your microphone and ask the question. And um, we'll just go and see how this works. So Karen, I give you the floor. Thank you for being here and telling your story. Well, Nancy, thank you so much for your support, for inviting me, Renata, um, the association. I really appreciate this. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about how Einstein, the man, the humanitarian, really saved our family. So would you like to proceed? Yes. Okay, so first of all, I'm really honored to be here and I am honored to be part of the association and the whole idea of the Einstein Discovery Museum and the work that you are doing to really cement the relationship between Albert Einstein and Ulm to further his legacy and to inspire all the future generations. So your work is gonna live on and this is really a living testament to Einstein, the family man, the humanitarian and the Ulmer. So because of Einstein's generosity, his vision, his humanity, my mother's family was rescued and I had a chance to be born and live in the world. Yes. So why did Einstein care about my family? He cared because my family was also his family. And he was very much um, interested in the people in his family. So uh, Albert Einstein and my grandmother, um, Fred, uh, Frida Moss, they were first cousins. And um, Albert's father, Herman, and Frida's mother, Frederike, were brother and sister. So that's my relationship. Now, Frederike was one of five children, and Frederike and Adolf, her husband, who was her first cousin, had eight children. But I'm just highlighting my part because the screen would be too small for you to see everybody. <laughs> Any questions? No. No? No. So. We'll talk about the family in Ulm, in the Empire, and the Weimar Republic first. So the Moss family had a long history in Ulm as merchants. Einstein's grandmother was a Moss, and what we see here is an advertisement from the store of my great-grandfather, who was Albert's uncle, Adolf Moss, from the 27th of August, 1887. He was married to his first cousin, Frederike, who was the sister of of Einstein's father. And I want to thank Ingo Bergman who gave me this. And this is going to be part of the family museum also. 
In January of 1886, Adolf Moss, who was born in Kappel near Buchau on April 1st, 1853, became a citizen of Ulm. And this was a very big deal for a Jewish merchant. And it meant that he was going to be a full participant in Ulm society, Ulm life, the government, everything. On the left, you see a picture of my grandfather standing in front of his store. He was Leopold Hirsch, and the store was called M.U. Hirsch in the Huffergasse 8 to 10 in Ulm. And um, my grandfather, my great grandfather, had actually lived in the United States for a whole decade before he returned to Ulm permanently. And on the right, you see me in front of the same storefront in 2018. And many of you may have been in the store. Can you recognize it? On the I don't left, see any pictures. You don't see the pictures? No, ma'am. I'm sorry. I see you and hear you, but I, I don't see any pictures. Um, can, can people let me know? Do other people see the pictures or no? I see. I see you. I see it. I can see. Yes, see it. Yes. I think most of us see it, but there's probably some uh, the, something you have to click on in order to see the pictures. Yeah, it's in the what top you, right corner. If you look at the screen with where the faces are, it's in the top right corner, and that should um, switch the faces for the PowerPoint. Hopefully. It's actually true. It works. Does this help? Is everyone seeing now? Yes. Okay, so let's continue. Okay. Wait, go back. So this is the Hirsch home um, on Neutrstrasse 36, and this is the home that my mother grew up in. Um, so on the, the picture on the left, we see the house in the 1930s. And on the right, this was taken after Ulm was bombed in December of 1944. Mm -hmm. wow. This is a picture of my mother and her brother Fritz. Um, Fritz was much older. He was born in 1908, my mother in 1921. So, um, but the story involves him too. So I wanted you to have a picture of him. <laughs> This is a picture of my mother with friends taken in 1928. And on the back of the um, photo, I don't know, if maybe Nancy can help me. You can see the names of the girls. Wait, and, wait, wait. And they, they are Jewish names and Christian names and they all played together. This was the world she grew up in, the world she knew where Jews and Gentiles played happily together. Let mm me -hmm. see the name, Lampata. Today is uh, an important name in Ulm, Lamparta. Lamparta? Yeah, yeah. There's the family is always, uh, always in, in Ulm. Uh huh. This is her mother here. Do you see my arrow? Yes. 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 That's nice. <laughs> this is another picture of my mother on, on her beloved Danube. Yes. Yeah, she's with her girlfriend and um, I think her governess. And you see the monster in the background. Yes. Can you move? I think it's important that people mute their, their microphones so that um, there's no such, there's not too much disturbing noise in the background. Thank you. This is a picture of my mother uh, with her girlfriend on the Hirschstrasse, really close to the monster. Well, we all know that after 1932, things got very difficult for Jewish families and they were persecuted and some of them were able to escape. 
So beginning in the mid 1930s, Albert Einstein began to use his considerable prestige to help members of the family exit Germany. This letter was written in 1935 for my mother's cousin, Alfred Moss, who emigrated to Palestine. And some of you may have met Michel um, in 2018. Um, he's on the city council in Freiburg. And Nancy, do you want to read it? Can people see it? Um, Herr Alfred Moos is mir als näher Verwandter wohl bekannt. Basically, it, it means that the, he, he is known to Albert Einstein. Er ist ein zuverlässiger und tüchtiger junger Mann. Ich kann Dienstexte Oops. leider nicht in deiner Musiksammlung finden. My, 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 my cell phone is speaking now. Um, and it means that he's, um, he was a good and active man. Um, and basically, it's just a message that say what type of person he is so that he can um, um, get helped. And, and what you all should know about him is that there's a street named after him in Ulm now because after the war, he came back with his family to reestablish relationships with Ulm. And he was really a noble person. But the unwanted, the unthinkable happened. The Nuremberg Law stripped Jews of political and social rights in 1936 prohibited intermarriage, confiscated businesses. And in, at Easter of 1936, the Jewish children were expelled from school. My mother was only 15 years old and she never went back to school. She, had she had a special friend at school. They were the same age and attended the Martin Oberreal this person stood out perhaps more than the others, her friend Sophie Scholl, whose bravery and sacrifice affected my mother deeply. She was murdered by the Nazis for treason, for handing out flyers protesting the government policies. My mother would never forget the group that Sophie was part of, the White Rose. And later in a letter uh, to my grandparents in the 40s, Albert Einstein sent a message to Sophie's father, Herr Scholl, through my grandfather. So as you can see, they were pretty closely knit and knew each other very well. So Hans and Sophie Scholl are very famous here. And there's, um, uh, there's actually a school which my children attend that are named after them, the Hans and Sophie Scholl Gymnasium here in Ulm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really tragic. She was like 23, I think. So many of you probably have seen this picture on the uh, memory book that was written by um, Ingo Bergman. And this is a book that commemorates the, um, the victims of uh, the Holocaust from Ulm. What you see in the picture that you don't know is there's my mother standing behind this group of children. So her form of resistance was to become the teacher of the children. And she didn't tell me about this, but I learned from some of these children that survived that she was their leader and their confidant. She, they told me that when they were not allowed to go to school, my mother taught them how to read and write and compute. And when they could not join Hitler Youth, my mother, who was a star athlete, um, took them skiing and skating and cycling and on all kinds of adventures. That was her form of resistance. So here she is with her students and the cantor who was also the principal of the school. And the school was right behind the synagogue. Of these children that you see here, five of them were deported to camps, four were murdered, one survived. And here is a picture of her little youth group in the woods playing the accordion and singing, being joyous, and there's my mom. And my, my mother kept a diary and we have her diary from her age of 12, from 1933 to 1939. This particular uh, segment is particularly touching. It was written October 30th, 1936. 
as the laws started to take effect and they really felt the pressure. But she wanders through Ulm with a feeling of impending departure and loss, overwhelming sadness. And she writes in there, she would never forget her Ulm, her Danube, and would always carry them in her heart. You can see it right here. Mich Danau, you see it? Mein Ulm, mein Danau. Nie vergessen, nie vergessen. Never forget. This is the synagogue after Kristallnacht. And my mother was visiting relatives in Berlin on Kristallnacht. Her parents summoned her home. It was time for them to make plans. They had lost control of their business, their synagogue, their freedom. So it was decided my mother would leave first. So now she's 17. So it took almost a year to arrange but she would go to the US to stay with her cousin, Professor Albert Einstein in Princeton, New Jersey. So as not to call attention to her journey, my mother had to leave from Stuttgart, not Ulm, by train. She couldn't even hug her parents goodbye because they didn't want to call attention to it. Uh, when she crossed the French border, she was detained by the French police and interrogated for seven days. They finally let her go, and this is the ship's manifest. The day that she sent mm -hmm. sail on the SS Manhattan from Le Havre on September 1st, 1939, was the same day that the Nazis invaded Poland. And this is, this is from the Passenger Manifest, and this is actually from the National Archives in the United States. Uh, it says that Annalisa Hirsch arrived on September 7th, 1939. She was born about 1921 in Germany from Ulm. She was 18 years old, a female citizen, and her destination was Professor Albert Einstein. Her departure was Le Havre, France. And on the bottom, I tried to highlight this. So it says, Cousin Professor Albert Einstein, 112 Mercer Street, Princeton, New Jersey. These are my grandparents, Leopold and Frieda Hirsch. So even with the affidavits and the financial support from their cousin, Albert Einstein, it took them a whole year more to arrange exit visas. And by this time, the Western route through France was closed because Europe was at war. They had to find another way out. So their flight from Germany took them six weeks. They crossed three continents, making 12 stops from Ulm to San Francisco via train, air, and ship. Albert Einstein paved their way a debt that he later forgave in writing, and you will see the letter later. They left on September 15th from Ulm and took a train to Berlin. Then from Berlin, they flew for the first time in their lives and they flew to Moscow. The government only allowed them $4 each, which is the equivalent of $73.75 US or $68 Euro today. Then they boarded in Moscow the Trans-Siberian Express, which is a train that goes across Siberia and China to Manchuli. Um, on the 22nd of uh, September, they boarded the train. The 27th, they were at Lake Bacal. The 29th, they crossed the Manchurian border to Manchuli. On October 1st, they arrived in Harbin, China. On the 2nd, they went to the capital, Manchukuo. On the 3rd, they crossed the Korean Peninsula by train to Fusan, which is a port where they boarded a boat and departed for Japan, Shimosaki, Japan. When they arrived there, they had to take a train 
across Japan to Kobe. They arrived on October the 4th. They were supposed to leave on October 7th aboard the Grover Cleveland to San Francisco. The boat was delayed three more days. They finally left Kobe, Japan on October the 10th. The, and this journey, we were going to take this, uh, replicate this journey in the fall because it would be 80 years this year. Um, they don't even have boats go across the Pacific like this anymore. It's too dangerous. They, um, they left Kobe, they crossed the international date line six days later. Nine days later, they were in Honolulu, which was then a territory of the US. And on October 25th, they arrived in San Francisco. You should note that along the way, they had a lot of trouble with the different border police. But when they arrived in San Francisco, um, the, border, uh, the border control, when they saw that Albert Einstein was my grandparents' um, sponsor, they just let them right in, no problem. And that's in my grandfather's letters. Now, my grandmother's brother, Hugo Moose, who was the grandfather of Michel that we talked about before, was also Einstein's first cousin. The family lore has it that Hugo just didn't believe that anybody would come for him. He was such an important part of Ulm. Well, sadly, he and his wife, Jenny, were deported to Treisenstadt on August 22nd, 1942, where they died. And as I told you before, Michael Moose sits on the Freiburg City Council. So he's continued the civic um, duties that his father instilled in him. My mother's older brother, Uncle Fritz, remained in Ulm trying to help other Jews get ex paper. And while he helped others to escape, in the end, he was unable to help himself. This is a letter from Albert Einstein to my grandmother, Frida, about getting an affidavit for Uncle Fritz. Einstein tried to help him leave. Could somebody who has a dog turn that off? Einstein tried to help him leave in 1941, but the affidavit got stuck in the bureaucracy. Fritz could not get out, and he was arrested by the Gestapo. But he was pretty clever. And as he boarded a train to Auschwitz, he produced papers from my great-grandfather, Moritz Hirsch, who, um, as I told you earlier, he became a US citizen, but he hated the US and came back to Ulm. Well, Fritz had the letter that made uh, his grandfather a US citizen. And because of that, uh, they took him off this train to Auschwitz and they put him in an American, in a POW camp with American prisoners. Uh, it was in um, Ilag 7 in Laufen. And this is Fritz with the circle with the American POWs. Then uh, my grandfather received a letter by the US State, State Department telling him that they were pleased to inform him that he had been released by the German government in a recent exchange of nationals between the US and Germany. So this is almost comical because here he is a German, a German Jew, and he's traded as an American for a German prisoner of war. And so he was supposed to leave and get on a transport to the US. This was 1945. However, go on. He writes this letter to his father. Sadly, the truth came out. And instead of going to the US, he got sent to a DP camp in North Africa. I'll read you just parts of it. He says, my dear parents, when you get this letter, you can't be more astonished than I was to learn that now I have to go to Africa. Well, to make a long, long story as short as possible. Basically, I got your letter from Laufen, um, and then he got transported to a different train 
And so he says, I ask you today urgently for the following. First, help me get out of here as soon as possible. Bring my papers in order. But remember, I have no passport. I don't know where to get one. If possible, send me a little pocket money and cigarettes. I think you have already moved to New York, so I will write to Uncle Atto. Uh, we are about 400 men and women, mostly Jews from Spain. We live in barracks, families together, get enough food, and then it was censored, it says. And um, basically he says, write soon, so long, most unhappily yours. So now he's stuck in North Africa. While he was in this camp, he met a German Jewish girl who had been a prisoner in Spain. She had been a medical student in Germany and in 1933, she could see that she had no hope of finishing her education. So she went to the University of Barcelona where she um, studied with a very famous ophthalmologist. A few weeks before her graduation, she was arrested by the Spanish police for just being a Jewish woman. And so she was stuck there too. And she was in prisoner for four years. So Fritz was trying to help her. He asked Einstein for help. Albert said he would only support her if they were married. So they did get married thinking they would just divorce in the US. But as fate would have it, Greta, my Aunt Greta found herself pregnant upon arrival. So she and Uncle Fritz stayed married for more than 40 years and they had two children, my cousins, Jerry Hirsch, who lives in Miami, and Ron Hirsch, who lives in Arizona. This is a content of the five envelopes that were sent to the US consulate in Algiers. It includes affidavits of support from Professor Einstein. He had to prove that he was employed by Princeton University. So there's an affidavit from uh, Princeton. They have statements of his war bonds, his bank accounts, Einstein's, and additional, all of his assets. And then affidavits of support from three other people, which were my grandmother, my grandfather, and my mother's first husband. Fred Rosendahl, even all the way down to the income tax, the bank group turns, everything. So he really stepped up to the plate to help the family. He really family. worked hard, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, he would never have gotten out otherwise. And then they got the telegram, leave Algiers for New York. Yay. <laughs> and here Einstein says, it's a miracle. So they had to start over, new beginnings. This picture was taken in San Francisco. And you see all the papers? This was a group of Germans that were working very hard to get all the documentation they needed to become citizens and to help other people get out. So um, for my mother, her regained freedom in America, Einstein gave her some money to get started. And she just felt that she had to be independent. And in order to be independent in America, she had to be able to drive. And drive in style, she did. <laughs> but Einstein thought she was kind of foolish to spend his money in this way. But that meant a lot to her. Nice car. <laughs> nice car, right? <laughs> so here, Einstein writes a letter of support for my grandfather, to help him get a start. It's just a letter of recommendation, another affidavit. And he helped my grandfather get his first job in the US. So the story I told you about their flight from Germany, he put it down in English um, and it was published by the San Francisco Chronicle in five parts. And because of this story, that was their first money that they made in the United States. So, and the originals of this are in the Einstein archives in Jerusalem. 
So then uh, this is a translation of a letter that was written to my grandfather, dear cousin. I'm happy to learn from your letters that you are getting along fine and adjusting well to your new environment. I know it's high, hard to find work at our age because they were about the same age. Uh, I admire your ability to the, know the language so well that you can write down your experiences in English. I most certainly could not do that. And then he goes on to say, please do not give back the money that I have given you for the trip. It could not have been spent in a better way. And I am happy about that. Please do not mention it anymore and forget about it. Heartfelt greetings and wishes to you all. Signed, Albert. It's a pretty strong letter there. Pretty strong, huh? Yes. And this picture of my mother with her parents reunited in the US. So Aunt Nancy, you're gonna have to help me with this one. But he basically is talking uh, to his cousin and he's talking about my mother in the second paragraph. Then Annelise. Wenn er eine so befriedigende Stelle hat, so ist sie, ist es vielleicht zweifelhaft, ob sie dort möchte. Basically, I think they, they wanted her yeah. to come to San Francisco and he's saying if she has a job that she likes that they should leave Let her alone. Stay there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they listened to his advice. He, he, he was really their friend. And here, is this the one where uh, he congratulates the wedding? What is this one? Yep, the, the wedding of your daughter. Yeah, so he's congratulating about my mother's wedding or marriage. Because it wasn't a wedding. Yeah. And so because he let, he advised them to let her stay in New York, he changed her history, really, and mine. <laughs> right? Because if yep. she went to San Francisco, who knew? So here she is with her first husband, and he writes a letter about uh, how happy he was about the visit of Annalise and her wonderful husband, who looks very robust, left over from the Maccabees time, like a solid rock. <laughs> and you can read the German. I mean, it's basically the same as what you... Just, what I just, just said. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hysterical, really. Yeah. But unfortunately, this marriage didn't last long. He died after they were married only six years. And my mother was a widow at age 27. So here they are reunited. You see my mother standing on the left. That's my cousin, Jerry, about a year old. In the arms of my grandfather, Leopold. Now below him is my mother's mother-in-law, her first husband's mother. Her name was also Frida. Then to the left, you have my uncle Fritz, his wife, Greta. And to the left, my grandmother, Frida, also. So Frida, my mother's mother-in-law, was a very generous woman. And she didn't want my mother to be alone. So she had a friend who had been a prisoner of war in Germany. And he knew this Yugoslavian doctor who had also been a POW for four years, Dr. Armin Glinert. And um, they fixed them up, and only they went to different places. And so because of the mix up, neither one wanted to meet each other. And the uh, two um, matchmakers said, well, try again. So they did. And my father was so uh, taken by my mother that he proposed on the very first date. And it took six months, but they married and my mom then moved to Chicago where my father had his practice. And so the following year, I came along. That's you. That's me <laughs> with my mom and my grandpa. <laughs> so my mother brought, you remember the diary that she wrote? She carried Ulm with her to the United States in everything she did. We had German food in my house. We, we ate goulash with spätzle, sauerbraten, Wiener schnitzel, stuffed cabbage, muesli. We had sparkling water, not regular water. We had Himbersoft, German pancakes, which stolen at the holidays. Uh, my house was filled with Ulm memorabilia. 
There were books about Ulm. There were beer steins. There were plates with the Munster on it, calendars with the Munster, other Ulm scenes. We had the Blue Danube China, the Ulmer spots everywhere. And the place where they decided to live was eight blocks from a church that looked like the Munster. <coughs> We have another, we, don't we have a picture of that someplace? Yeah, or maybe it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, you'll see it. Yeah. So that's just some of the memorabilia. You can see the, the Steins, the Wiener Schnitzel, the Spätzle. My mother wore an Edelweiss a lot. Uh, we have the plate with the Munster. There's the, Spot, the Ulmer Spatz. Pictures of Ulm. And then go on. We shopped at a German delicatessen every week. We ate German food and it was really kind of weird because my mother, we, well, America had been at war with the Germans, but she was so ingrained that it was bad to be Jewish that she had to be embarrassed. But she would tell everyone, oh, I'm German. <laughs> and she was so proud of it. It's, it's kind of comical to me. So here's the church. Here you have on top the Ulmer Munster and the inside. And you have on the bottom, Queen of All Saints, Basilica, right by my house, and the inside. And she used to drag us to midnight mass. We weren't, we weren't Catholic, but we went anyway. Very similar, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and my mother stayed in touch with her own friends. I don't know people from elementary and high school, hardly at all. My mother stayed in, friends, in touch with all her friends. And she went back to Ulm starting in the 1970s. And she stayed in touch with Ulmers her entire life. This is a picture of my mother standing next to um, my niece, Emily, my brother's daughter, um, in 2004 when we went to the 125th birthday of Einstein. My mother brought, my brother and I, and each of us brought one And even when my mom passed away in 2015, they asked us what to put on the gravestone. And my brother and I talked for a long time. And the only thing that we thought made sense was the Ulmer Spatz and Edelweiss. So she carried it with her. So I've continued to stay in touch with Ulm also. I, my first trip was in 1977, and at that time, I was able to meet my mother's cook, the governess. I climbed the Munster. I went to the Bodensee where my mother would go swimming, uh, and I returned on several of the reunions that the Stadt Ulm has, has put together, 1997, 2004, which was the 125 years of Einstein, 2012, the reopening of the synagogue, 2018, when Ingo Bergman invited me to uh, give a talk, and last fall, 2019, and my plan was to be with you today in person in Ulm. But which, which would have been great. Maybe, maybe your story is, is told more in, in this format, Karen. <laughs> maybe, thanks to coronavirus. <laughs> <laughs> this is my family, my um, the new generation. One of my daughters, Erica, is married to a German engineer from Rosenheim and uh, has two grands. I have two grandsons that are German, Lucas and Marcus. My other daughter, Christina Alana, married a rabbi's son and she has three children, Noah, Jacob, and Annalise. They live, they live in, in USA or, or in Germany? They all live in the Chicago area. Chicago. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> so my ongoing connections to Ulm, and this is taken in the Café Troglin. Oh, the Troglin. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh -huh. um, so I'm connected to all of you through the Einstein Family Museum that the Stadt Ulm is, is developing with Ingo Bergman at the lead. Your Discovery Museum in Ulm, which I think is just fantastic. I have now all of you friends and colleagues. I am learning German. Uh, maybe next time I can talk to you a little bit in German. I'm, my goal is to obtain German citizenship, kind of for my mother, but they changed the law 
in August and I would be able to, to get citizenship through my mother, but I have to pass the language exam. Mm -hmm. So I'm working very hard on that. And I well, guess we should have, speak have, German have, now, Karen. Huh? What? We should speak German now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. So mm -hmm. anyway, and so like I said, I have the son-in-law who's German and two grandsons. Okay, Nancy, we can talk once a week. Yeah. <laughs> Help me. German <laughs> lessons, 101. <laughs> yeah, I would love it. Well, I'm supposed to well, take the A1 test this week and next month. So that was your entire presentation. Yeah. And I think the story is totally fascinating, especially for those of us here at the Albert Einstein Discovery Center Association, because it's the story of Einstein as a man. It's your story that bridges the gap between the United States and Ulm. And it just shows so much about the history of the time and the man that he was.